On tonight's call, we want to cover beating viral illness naturally and using a safe, inexpensive, natural, and effective strategy to eliminate infection. Now, the title is Beating Viral Illness Naturally because, you know, since March 2020, virus is what's been on everyone's mind. But this applies equally to bacterial infections and microbial infections in general. And we want to use a nebulizer to do this. And in the picture, you can see me at home nebulizing. Uh, this was probably a month or so ago. I had symptoms um, of infection. So I was nebulizing at home because I practice what I preach, you know? So when I start to feel symptoms, any upper respiratory symptoms at all, throat, sinusy, you know, cough, or even if I have systemic symptoms that don't seem like upper respiratory, uh, like maybe GI and stool changes, I will hop on the nebulizer and try and nip it in the bud early because it's very effective and easy to do. So let's talk about that today. Why is the nebulizer effective and how is it effective? Excuse me. Well, what we want to understand first is how our immune system works. And so when we have an infection, our immune system is mobilized, right? And we want to kill the pathogen or the infective agent, whatever that is. And the way that the immune system does that is with this thing called an oxidative burst. Oxidative stress produces free radicals. You may have heard the term free radicals. And if you've heard of the term antioxidant, you take antioxidants to neutralize free radicals or neutralize oxidative stress. If you've worked with me one-on-one, -on -one, then in our visits, I've, I've described oxidative stress metaphorically as rust, because if you have a steel bumper on your car and you leave it outside, you know, or, or it's an old car, obviously you're leaving your car outside, uh, over time that steel bumper will oxidize or rust. So oxidative stress promotes rusting or oxidation in the body via free radical formation. We need antioxidants to neutralize the pro-oxidants so we don't damage tissue. Well, the immune system uses rust or uses oxidative stress, uses free radicals to kill the infections that we sustain. So if we have a, an acute infection, we're gonna use an oxidative burst to try and kill the pathogens. Our immune system is gonna use the oxidative burst to do that. If we have a chronic infection, then we're also gonna use oxidative burst to go after that. The problem is that sometimes those chronic infections are encased in biofilm and the biofilm promotes the chronicity or the persistence of that infection. So we want to, in that case, disrupt biofilms so that we can access those infections and kill those infections. So how does the oxidative burst get produced? Well, that's called a Fenton reaction. And what you see here in the image is on the viewer's left, you see H2O2, that's hydrogen peroxide. And on the right, you see OH negative, that's hydroxyl radical. And that OH negative is the most reactive oxygen species or the meanest free radical that we know of in science. So when that guy's around, when that guy's present, whatever it's close to, it's damaging. Okay, so if that thing is, you know, birthed in your cell right next to your mitochondria, you're damaging your mitochondria. If it's next to your nucleus, you're damaging your nucleus. Or if it's extracellular and it's next to your an epithelial cell, you know, in your vasculature or in your gut, you're damaging that barrier. Okay, so the the hydroxyl radical is very dangerous, very potent at destroying or damaging whatever it's touching. So our immune system will convert hydrogen peroxide to hydroxyl radical to kill the pathogens we're facing. In order for that to happen, we need a catalyst. And on the gray arrow that you see between the two molecules is iron or copper. So if we need iron or copper to drive hydrogen peroxide to hydroxyl radical, and create the oxidative burst so we can kill the infection. Therefore, if you're deficient in 
iron or deficient in copper, then you may not be able to drive this reaction forward and therefore you may not be able to sufficiently kill microbes and therefore you could be chronically infected. On the flip side, if you have iron overload or copper toxicity, you may be driving this reaction forward far too much. And in that case, yeah, you may, you may have an Uzi just, just wiping out microbes, but once all the microbes are dead, all that's left is your self tissue. So now you're damaging self, right? And that's why people with iron overload or copper toxicity can promote autoimmune disease or tissue damage of another nature, just self harm. So we don't want to have too much iron or copper. We don't want to have too little iron or copper. We want Goldilocks iron or copper. We want just right. Another thing that we want is enough hydrogen peroxide. Now that might seem weird, right? Because you've learned, you know, you put a hydrogen peroxide on a wound and it burns a little bit, but you know, you do it because you're, you, you know, intuitively, Hey, that's going to kill bacteria that may have got in the wound when you sustained it. So it's worth the burn or the pain. If you read health literature, you may have read that hydrogen peroxide is a free radical and damages tissue. It's actually not. It's a potential free radical. Okay, so think of hydrogen peroxide as a free radical in waiting. In order for it to have a free radical effect, you need the iron or the copper to catalyze the Fenton reaction and convert that hydrogen peroxide into hydroxyl radicals. So if you're deficient in hydrogen peroxide, iron or copper, you're not going to kill the way you need to so you could be chronically infected. This applies to COVID, this applies to strep throat, this applies to you know, periodontitis and gum disease. So whatever we're talking about. Now why the long, you know, potentially boring biochemistry there? Well, because hydrogen peroxide is one of the key ingredients that I am nebulizing with in this picture. And one of the key ingredients that science has shown is super effective for killing virus or killing microbial infections. And as you all know, it's readily available and super inexpensive. So let's dive into using it. Now we talked about when you have an infection, we want to kill the microbe, but we also, if there's biofilms involved, we need to disrupt those biofilms. Well, there's, a few agents that can do all three of those things that can destroy the biofilm or help prevent biofilm formation by dissolving pathogens and killing pathogens. Well, hydrogen peroxide is one of those things. Ozone is one of those things. Vitamin C is one of those things. All three of those will, will perform the tasks we want done when we're nebulizing with an infection. Magnesium helps prevent biofilm formation. DMSO is, you know, needs to be prescribed. So let's not worry about that one today. Uh, antioxidants will help prevent biofilm formation. They might kill pathogens depending on the pathogen. Zinc and vitamin E are also effective in preventing biofilm formation. And iodine can be used to kill pathogens. Iodine is another one of those things that we know, hey, we treat wounds with iodine because they have antimicrobial properties. So these are things that you could put in your nebulizer and nebulize so that you're killing the infection. What is a nebulizer? A nebulizer is a machine that takes a liquid and nebulizes it or turns it into uh, fine molecules that you can inhale and they are delivered to the lungs, sinuses, throat, you know, uh, upper respiratory tract, and the, the GI tract, the upper GI tract as well. So you are, it's another name for it is inhalation therapy. So you're taking liquid and turning it into gas essentially and inhaling it, and then it can directly contact the mucosal surfaces of your throat of your sinuses of your oral cavity your gums etc and directly kill pathogens and disrupt biofilms 
So this isn't an exhaustive list. This is from a book by Thomas E. Levy, who's a medical doctor and a lawyer, a very smart man, a very prolific writer, has written many books. And he's got a new book out, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but this is from that book. This is not an exhaustive list. This is a list that he put out. Um, other things that I commonly nebulize with are N-acetylcysteine, are I'll put vitamin D in there. I'll put astragalus in there. I will put sulforaphane in there. So there's, you can essentially nebulize anything that you can get in a liquid form, but obviously you want to know why you're doing it and have a reason for it. One other thing I want to note, hydrogen peroxide. You may have heard that hydrogen peroxide is, is dangerous and unstable and Again, that's not true. Hydrogen peroxide is actually an awesome little molecule because it, 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 it targets the infected cells specifically. Or if you're talking about cancer, it can target cancer cells specifically. And it spares the healthy cells. Whereas, you know, if you're talking about cancer, chemotherapy does not spare healthy cells. It kills healthy cells too. So, you know, how does it do that? How does a molecule know which cell is sick and which cell is healthy? Well, by iron status. So we talked briefly that Fenton reaction requires iron for cat to be catalyzed and iron is, is much more commonly used than copper. So how, what would allow the hydrogen peroxide to move forward to a hydroxyl radical and kill pathogens or kill cancer cells preferentially over healthy cells. The key is copper. Pathogens like to steal our iron. Pathogens like to accumulate iron so that they can function and reproduce. In the same way, um, cancer cells like to accumulate iron. So the more iron that is, or excuse me before I move forward with that, as compared to healthy cells have very little iron accumulation. So the more iron that is in a cell, the higher the potential that a Fenton, action, a Fenton reaction will move forward and the higher the potential for oxidative burst and death of that cell. So by accumulating our iron, stealing our iron, pathogens are making themselves more susceptible to hydrogen peroxide Fenton reaction induced death as our cancer cells. And one way to drive that process forward is high dose vitamin C. So if you nebulize with both the hydrogen peroxide and vitamin C, you're creating a powerful one-two punch to promote killing of the pathogens and prevention of biofilm formation and chronicity of infection. Also from Dr. Levy's book is, this is a general table he gives in terms of you know, how often should I nebulize and for how long? Um, he gives this table here based on symptoms and how deep you are into them. You know, so early onset of symptoms, he says three to four times daily, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, I, I echo that, you know, in this picture when I was nebulizing early on first noticing symptoms, I try to do at least three times a day for six minutes. I usually go 10 minutes because I'm reading or doing something while I'm sitting there. So yeah, I can, I can definitely jump on board with that one. If you think you've had possible exposure, like you went out to Easter and you had family members that you think you may have been exposed to COVID or exposed to strep throat, well then come home and it's, you know, that night nebulize. And he says two to three minutes, I would do at least the six minutes, even to the 10 minutes, because you want to just, inhale, saturate those mucosal tissues with substrate to be able to kill whatever you're exposed to. Um, and then for a maintenance dose, he mentions doing once a week for two to five minutes, just as a preventative prophylactic treatment. That's totally up to you. Here's the book um, that I referenced and got these tables from, and it's currently available for free download at this website. And it is 300, over 300 pages and contains over 600 scientific references. And it's great. I've, I've, haven't read the whole thing yet, but I've read, 
a good portion of it and he's a very good writer and uh, for those of you who like reading health books I think this will be stimulating for you and I think like you see there no need to live in fear one of the best things the book can do for you other than give you the scientific info is help you understand that you're not you know you don't have to fear viruses viruses have been on this planet co-evolving with humans for longer than we've been alive they're going to be here much longer much beyond when you and i die um quote unquote pandemics have been here throughout humanity they're going to be here forever so we can't change our society and change our behaviors based on media reports of pandemic because pandemic's never going to go away so are you going to give up your freedoms forever in hopes that you know someday they'll finally give them back to you so read the book get the scientific knowledge and gain the confidence uh, from that knowledge that will allow you to move forward with your life without having to worry about silly things so here's the recipe that I use commonly in my nebulizer. A, obviously you need a nebulizer. Um, so you can get those on Amazon. You can get all this stuff on Amazon if you want to. So you need a nebulizer. Then you, the, you see the piece over my mouth and the bulb right underneath that. That bulb is what contains the liquid. And so you want to put 0.9% sterile saline in there. The saline helps coat your mucosal barriers and keep them hydrated and moist. And then, so that's kind of a carrier liquid. And then you want to get 3% food grade hydrogen peroxide. And this is not the brown bottle that you're used to, that you dump on your wounds or use for ear infections, if you've seen my other videos on that. The 3% food grade is food grade, whereas the brown bottles could have toxins and metals and different things in them. So get, make sure you get the food grade one because you're inhaling this. Uh, and then it's up to you in terms of what kind of active agent you want to use in addition to the hydrogen peroxide. You could just use hydrogen peroxide and be totally good there. Um, like we said earlier, hydrogen peroxide and vitamin C together is like, you know, marriage made in immune system heaven. So doing those two would be great. I like to add colloidal silver to mine, silver is a great antimicrobial. Silver is another thing that is used commonly in conventional medicine for wound treatment. And acetylcysteine is shown to be antiviral, antimicrobial, promotes glutathione production. It's a Swiss army knife, so that's great to have on board. And then astragalus is an herb that promotes natural killer cell activity and a Th1 immune response, which are both key factors in clearing viruses and clearing intracellular infections. So that's just, you know, a small taste. I've created nebulizer brews before with vitamin D in them, with vitamin A in them. Just it, it depends on what I'm trying to accomplish and what your knowledge base is and all of that. But here's a primer for you on nebulizer treatment or inhalation medicine as it's called. And it's, it's you know, once you have the nebulizer, which is fairly inexpensive. There can be found on Amazon for about 40 bucks. Uh, you're set to, um, you know, prophylactically treat as much as you want, or just keep it until you have an exposure and symptoms and use it then. So let's open up for questions. I have a lot of questions. Shoot. Being as I've, I've done this, Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I had to get a prescription for that sterile saline. No, you don't. It's on Amazon. Oh, really? Well, yep. I went to uh, Walgreens and they told me I needed a prescription. But other than that, this other stuff you add, you know, NAC, I have that, but it's, it's in a pill form. It's granular. Yep. So do I. So you just open the capsule and don't dump it all in there because you'll need a lot of fluid but you know sprinkle some in there and the nebulizer you know you'll create your concoction and uh you know 
it's a bunch of fluid and whatever granules you're dumping in there. So swish it around to try and mix it as best you can. And then the nebulizer will, will push it on through. And the same with the vitamin C and the, and the astragalus. Yeah. So the astragalus, I use a, a, a tincture, like a, an astragalus tincture. So it's a, it's a astragalus and al alcohol, you know, so I'll just put however m many drops of that I want in there. The vitamin C, if you can get liposomal forms of these things, it's easier to, you know, that's already semi-liquid and you can put it in there and swish it up easier um, and, and get a higher dose out of it than the powder you would be putting in. But you don't need as large of a dose when you're nebulizing because orally you're taking it, it has to go through first pass metabolism and through the system to get to wherever you're hoping it goes. If you're trying to target ENT area, right, an upper respiratory area, then you can just inhale it and go directly to the spot. So you're not, you're not kind of overdosing, expecting that not all of it's going to get there. Does that make sense? Like you would orally. Now you, you gave me an actual recipe, like one milliliter, or half a milliliter, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but as you know, I was low on iron. Mm -hmm. I've been taking iron pills. Mm -hmm. So technically, if I didn't, well, I didn't know I was low on iron when I started doing this. Didn't do me any good? Yeah, it did you good. But I, I thought you said I, if you were low on iron, it wouldn't work. If you're low on iron, it's not going to work as optimally as if you're not low on iron. But while you're you're still getting benefit. The that's why you know I like things beyond the hydrogen peroxide because colloidal silver has its own antimicrobial activity by itself. NAC does by itself. Vitamin C isn't directly antimicrobial, but indirectly by supporting immune function will do it. You know, astragalus will do it. So um, that's why you know I like the mix of other things because if you're you know say you're a different woman, say you're a woman who's on her cycle and you have heavy cycles and during your heavy cycles, your iron tanks, while well, you're still getting benefit from the nebulizer session from the other things beyond the hydrogen peroxide, if for some reason your Fenton reaction isn't going forward as smoothly as possible. Okay, and you mentioned biofilm, but I don't know what biofilm is. Biofilm is um, the I picture it as like an igloo that the microbes build to hide under. Essentially, it's like a polysaccharide mucusy thing they excrete and it's, it's a covering for them. So an igloo that the bugs hide under it and our immune system and our current testing procedures can't penetrate that or see in there. And so research suggests 65 to 80% of infections contain biofilms. Uh, biofilms tend to accumulate on medically inserted devices like catheters and pacemakers and knee joints and things like that. Um, but they're also present in people who've never had a medical implant. So, um, so that it's a pathogen evasion strategy. Basically, it's a way for them to not be caught. Okay. Um, so we want to disrupt those biofilms or basically rip the roof off the isis cell is another metaphor I use so that we can then see what's in there and have the gun fight and, and wipe them out. Okay. Are you nebulizing on the onset of symptoms or could you nebulize when you have full-blown symptoms or is there a certain sweet spot of when to? Um, I, I, I mean, the earlier the better, right? An ounce of prevention was worth a pound of cure. Um, so the sooner the better, but even in full-blown, I mean, I nebulized that whole week that I was, until I don't, until I'm asymptomatic, you know, and then maybe a day beyond that just to kick it in the pants. Um, so you're not going to, you know, it, it, it's, it's, this is very, very safe because you're, the, the dosing and the exposure level is small compared to if you were swallowing something orally. Um, so, you know, obviously work with your practitioner. This isn't medical advice to anyone that is watching this and doesn't have a relationship with me. Um, 
So speak with your practitioner for moving forward with it. But in general, it's a very safe and effective method. And what brand of nebulizer? Here we go. You need your own Amazon store. Yeah, yeah. You do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. But, you know, I don't know that it's the pennies Amazon would give me is worth it setting up. Um, but here's a bunch of them, you know. So I have one called Wave Medical. I got it off of Amazon. It looks like this one here, the third one. This It's not the same exact one, but it, it pretty much, they're all very similar. You're going to have a block looking thing that you plug into the wall. You're going to plug a tube into the block and a tube into the bulb. And then they, they give you various uh, facial attachments like this. You just put in your mouth and inhale. Uh, there's masks. I like the masks because you're getting Na uh, you know, you're getting the nasal sinuses, not just the oral cavity. So I would say, you know, always do the mask unless for some reason you just want to do mouth, but that gets, gets the whole thing. And then I'll rotate between inhaling through my mouth and inhaling through my nose. So I'm exposing the tissues, you know, evenly, but you can see there's, there's all kinds of different looking, uh, well, we're lower on the page here, but there's all kinds of different looking machines out there. See, thumbs up. In your picture, in that little bulb, it looks really white. Is that condensation or is that your? Uh, you have... Well, so when you mix, um, when you mix alcohol and non-alcohol thing, so I put some, this mm -hmm. one, I had some astragalus or sulforaphane, some sort of alcohol tincture that I added. So the alcohol and the nebulizer starts to foam it gets foamy um, and sometimes it'll look brown depending on the herbs uh, so that's just an effect of what I put in there it's, if you just have the saline and the hydrogen peroxide it, it won't look foamy is, is and if you use like if you excuse me one second if you use liposomal ingredients too those have fat in it so that can foam as well can can you send us a um, a recipe for how much of what to put in? I can't because I don't know what you're dealing with. Um, but in general, you want so the hydrogen peroxide. If you overdo the hydrogen peroxide, it can sting. Okay. Yeah. So I I would say use one mL of the sterile saline because that's what's hydrating you and kind of cutting everything else. Uh, and then say a half ml of the hydrogen peroxide. So try and keep and it. And it still stings. Yeah. So oh, it does. It depends only, on your, on only your the first two times. Yeah. You're and and for me, I'm talking more about stinging the eyes because because if you look at my picture, you know the thing covers your your nose and mouth, but there's holes right here to let fluid or let gas through. So the gas, you know, the nebulized hydrogen peroxide can get in your eyes and, and feel kind of sting. So uh, you could wear glasses or swimming goggles or something to, to oh. stop that if you like. Or you could cut it so that you could either cut the hydrogen peroxide or add more saline. So tagging along on what Janine said, what would be just a good maintenance recipe, a good. Mm -hmm. um, the, I guess, assuming good iron levels, the saline and the hydrogen peroxide um, and some vitamin C. And if you're a colloidal silver fan, um, that's a great, great one as well. And how, like a couple drops of vitamin C? Uh, depends how you're delivering it. If you're using, you know, powder, then put powder in until, you know, you're getting sediment and then it's not mixing, right? So a little less than sedimentary vitamin C, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, if it's liposomal, you know, yeah, you could just put, put drops in. Um, I don't really, I mean, I don't, I just kind of, here I put some in, I'm not counting drops. Because mm -hmm. once you're doing drops, like how much is in a drop anyway, I don't even know. Right. 
What else? Well, this sounds like a good idea um, just for an ongoing thing. And particularly when you're getting, when you think you might have been exposed to a virus or you just feel something coming on. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, all it's, again, it's very inexpensive once you buy the stuff once because you're using right. such small amounts that you're going to have stock for a very long time. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's not a big deal. And then after you have that, all it's costing you is your time to sit down for six, 10, 15, however long minutes you're doing it. I've found that my bulb at, you know, if I have three MLs of contents total in there, it's la it, by about 12 minutes, it's, it's, it's empty anyways. Mm. So, um, you know, it's, it's just, will you take the time to do it? <laughs> yeah, that's which, the bottom line. Which, which hopefully you will because it's, you know, it's effective, easy, safe. Um, you know, if you don't take the time to do it and the infection progresses, then you're like, well, I wish I used 12 minutes earlier instead of a copay and all this stuff later. Yeah, the nebulizer is the price of a copay. Right. And it's probably going to give you more benefit than whatever happens at the copay. <laughs> well plus you know you've got to think about it in terms of your time too because if you go in it's your time to get there wait be seen come back you know this is just sort of right there and you go get it yeah and if you think you're exposed and that's why you think you want to do it and you go in your exposure risk is higher going in <laughs> than it is to just sit in your kitchen and nebulize or right. wherever you're nebulizing. Well, can we get a facial at the same time? Around the mask. <laughs> <laughs> we could do two things at once. We could be. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you use just the mouthpiece part, yeah, you, your whole face will be there. <laughs> so looking at your picture, now that you talked about the vents on the side or the holes on the side, so that's a nose strap just to hold up the uh, there's a, so the, let me get my pointer here. So the strap is holding the whole mask on. So it's all one piece. Oh, and the, oh, bulb, oh. the bulb plugs in right there. So the bulb will separate, but that whole mask is one piece. Oh. So separate pieces are mask, bulb, you know, the uh, cable that, the uh, tube that connects to the nebulizer. So this bulb is right there is the top and the bottom. You unscrew it so you can drop in your fluids, screw it, stick it in the mask, turn the machine on. Would you recommend this for, um, let's say, a child 10 and above? Oh, yeah. I have, and you can see uh, where to go. All, almost all the kits come with a child size mask as well so okay okay this is an adult mask this is a child mask um and there there's a if if the bulb fitting is different they'll give you the kid bulb and the adult bulb as well so yep I, my kids if if anything's going on plop a throw it on them and and say hey sit here sit here for 10 minutes yeah no i think that's a great idea could two people, I mean, obviously you have to clean out the bulb and all that stuff. Could two people use the same mask? Because um, I know like when you use a neti pot, they say you shouldn't really share a neti pot. You can never get it really clean the way mm -hmm. it should be. It's like having someone share your toothbrush. I'm yeah. just wondering, is this a bear to clean or can you use the no. same? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you can use the same. Uh, well, think about it. Everything that we're pumping through it is something that kills microbes, right? So it's essentially self-cleaning. Um, but even when I'm done, I'll just take, I'll take the mask off and just, you know, wash it like I'm washing dishes, dish soap all, all around it, lather it up, wash it off, let it dry. Um, and it's like a, you know, plastic, uh, you know, it's a moldable, squishy mm -hmm. kind of deal. So oh, okay, cool. Yeah, so it's it's soft. It's not it's not this hard CPAP machine. I wish I could put it in my CPAP. <laughs> that would be awesome. 
Um, so yeah, I would say, I mean, we have one that the whole family uses, huh. you know, except we have a kid, a kid size and an adult size, but my wife and I use the same mask and, you know, I clean it after, but it's probably just out of habit because mm -hmm. the hydrogen peroxide <laughs> cleaned it. Yeah. 